The information was hacked from the Office of Personnel Management. North Korea behind the hack on Sony. Russian hackers attempted to influence the U.S. presidential election. Have you ever been hacked? The Equifax hack of 2017 impacted nearly half of all Americans. That's it? That's all it takes. There was nothing to it, just a few keystrokes. That's right, and it's taking advantage of a software vulnerability in the system. That barely detectable flaw allowed hackers to steal the personal financial records of 143 million Americans. It's clearly a crime, but how do you prosecute it when there are no fingerprints, no witnesses, and no smoking gun to tell us who's responsible? I'm Dr. Shini Somara, and I'm here at the RAND Corporation, where a group of researchers have teamed up with Microsoft to try and meet the challenges of global cyber aggression. Cyber attribution, what is that? It's like digital forensics. You mean like detectives, like CSI, the internet? Yeah, sort of. So how long have people been doing this? Well, the first cyber detective, you could say it was Clifford Stoll. In 1986, he was working at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs when he discovered a cyber intrusion. It was a German hacker that was trying to steal American secrets and sell to the KGB. You mentioned the Equifax hack. Right. Have there been any other events as significant as that one? There's been a lot. PlayStation back in 2011, which compromised data for nearly 80 million of its users. The Target hack in 2013 affected over 100 million customers. Then there was the Yahoo breach. In 2017, they acknowledged that all 3 billion of their user accounts had been compromised. And 2017 was a really big year for ransomware attacks, right. or attacks that look like ransomware. Right. WannaCry and NotPetya cause millions of dollars of damage. Some even estimate in the billions. Turns out, the attack on the Ukrainian power there have been grid. a lot of these attacks. And increasingly, they're not the work of lone hackers. Instead, we're seeing highly trained and organized groups operating on behalf of nation states. Countries around the world have invested in offensive cybersecurity capabilities. Countries which are much smaller and may not have large armies in traditional conflict may still have reasonably sized cyber armies. Which they can use offensively against more powerful countries. We have international agreements like the Geneva Conventions of what's fair and what's acceptable conduct in conflict. But don't we have anything like that in cyberspace already? Not yet. There have been proposals, though. Right, but if cyberspace is the new domain of warfare, it stands to reason that civilians should be protected. And the international community hasn't really done that yet. That's exactly right. And the problem is we haven't come to a broad understanding of basic norms of acceptable behavior in cyberspace. And that's extremely dangerous. And that's what we face in cyberspace without norms and the basic accountability that we expect in all other aspects of our lives. And the cornerstone of accountability is attribution, determining who's to blame. And it's attribution that's considered to be the most significant challenge in the promotion of cybersecurity. Cyber attribution depends on three classes of indicator, technical, political, and clandestine. Technical indicators involve computing and network details, such as IP addresses, log file analysis, and review of software executables. Political indicators require diplomatic knowledge about the motivation of governments and political operatives. Clandestine indicators are produced by intelligence agencies with classified information that also involve political insights. In a physical crime, you're looking at the evidence, but with this stuff, you're not calling it evidence. You're calling them indicators. Does that mean that you don't know for sure? The indicators in isolation do not provide guarantees, but if you look at them all together, you can have a high level of confidence. Then what? Well, then the organization doing the research has to decide whether or not they want to go public with the attribution. And that brings up several risks. One, revealing the technical vulnerability of a particular system, or revealing the sources of methods that brought them to the attribution. So why go public? To help encourage potential victims to bolster their network defenses. But also to hold the attackers accountable. OK, but what good is public attribution if the attacker simply refuses to accept responsibility? Look at the DNC hack. US intelligence said it was Russia, and Russia just denied it. Suppose there was an objective third party that provided the attribution decision instead of just the victim that was attacked. But Russia could still deny it. But it enhances the credibility of the attribution decision and it enables the world community to stand by the victim in case retaliatory measures are necessary. Whatever the reason for declaring the attribution publicly, the organization announcing the attribution has to be skilled, has to have a track record of transparency, and there has to be an independent review process. 
And that's why we propose the GCAC. The GCAC, the Global Cyber Attribution Consortium, an organization that solely exists to determine the culpability for acts of cyber aggression. The idea is that governments may not be the most credible and persuasive source for an attribution. Governments often withhold public documentation to back up their attribution findings for fear of exposing clandestine sources and methods. There's also the question of simple partisanship. So, in the interests of objectivity and transparency, the RAND team suggests an international group, which is fundamentally stateless. With so many state actors involved in cyber aggression, the body can't be seen as being tied to any particular government. And their attribution must be made without the influence or the appearance of influence from nation state governments. We need to make sure we don't think about GCAC just from a US-centric point of view. These attacks are increasing in number and the victims include countries that don't have the resources to do their own investigations. So the benefit of GCAC might be that it helps the entire global community to deal with these attacks. So who would make up this body? Preferably independent experts from the legal world, technical experts, and policy experts. So they're it, they're the judge and the jury then? Well, not exactly the judge, because the GCAC wouldn't be in the business of deciding on how to punish attackers. They wouldn't make decisions about subsequent action. Instead, the exclusive role of the GCAC is to gather the evidence, to study it, and to determine who is responsible. Though a victim could use the findings of the GCAC to support taking further action. So if the GCAC or the GCAC is completely independent, who's going to pay for it? Philanthropic organizations. Or NGOs maybe the United Nations. There's also an argument for the big telecom and IT companies. After all, they make the software and the networking hardware upon which the cyber attacks occur. And a lot of the digital forensics tools for supporting analyses. It's in their interest to prevent their technology from causing harm to their customers. The RAND team is suggesting an organization with six core features. The first would be a formal process for determining whether GCAC would take on a case. Just like the US Supreme Court, there will be far more cyber-aggressive behaviors and incidents than the body can take on in a given year. What are the criteria that might be used to decide which events the body will take on? For example, if there's an attack against critical infrastructure or hospitals. Next, GCIC will have to collect evidence responsibly and be respectful of privacy and the sensitivities associated with the data. A transparent and consistent approach for assessing evidence must be utilized. It has to be a transparent process, it has to be repeatable, and it has to be something that's, um, that, that we can share. And because absolute certainty is rare in cyber attribution, there must be a mechanism for indicating the level of confidence associated with each finding announced by GCAC. The announcement process must also be consistent in language and format so that it's easy to compare the attribution statements over multiple cyber attacks. And there should also be a scheme to communicate and compare the relative severity of attacks, as we do with earthquakes or hurricanes. Technical competency, inclusivity, transparency, and a narrow focus on attribution. That sounds like a pretty tall order. It's a big problem. Does it solve it? It's the first step of a series of important steps we must take. There are few innovations that have transformed our lives as much as the internet. But with the promise of greater connectivity and universal access comes a tremendous risk to our individual privacy, to our economy, to our infrastructure, and our national security. Domestic institutions are evolving to meet that threat, but internationally, where bad actors loom the largest and where they have the will and the resources to do the most damage, there is no referee. Which is why the GCAC may be an idea whose time has come.